Hello everyone, welcome back to the show. My name's Dan, this Exploder, and I'm here with another episode just for you. In this episode, I want to talk about a particular topic. I've been liking going on these really topics. The last topic was about patriotism, the parts of wrestling, sort of the good and the bad of, of patriotism and jingoism and the good guys and the bad guys, America versus elsewhere and things of that sort. In this one, I want to talk about something very specific, something that's gone around the world but is adapted to each individual country. In this episode, I want to talk about masks. The role of mask in professional wrestling is very interesting, and it's something that goes back longer than you might think. Basically, think if you think wrestling masks are this old, you're wrong by probably about 100 years. In 1865, at the World's Fair in Paris, France, Theobald Bauer, I'm sure I'm butchering the first name, debuted as the first masked wrestler named the Masked Wrestler. I assume that at the time they were saving all their creativity for not dying of tuberculosis, and the mask was probably made of burlap and roofing nails but I digress. In 1915, the first American masked wrestler, the Masked Marvel, debuted in New York. That's a little better. It's a little better than the masked wrestler and masked Marvel. All right, I'll give it to you. Then it goes south of the border. Salvador Luteroth, a Texas wrestling promoter, took, the wrestling, took a wrestling show to Mexico in the 1930s. He founded a company called EMLL, Empresa Mundial de Lucha Libre. Now it is CMLL, which is the oldest continuous wrestling promotion in the world. Again, started in the 1930s and has been gone continuously to this day. He brought in an American wrestler named Cyclone McKee, and that inspired other characters and other ideas. Eventually, Luteroth would do something that would change the role of wrestling, mask, and lucha libre all together. He'd bring in the first real mask luchador, lucha libre superstar, El Santo. Rodolfo Guzman Huerta put on the mask of El Santo, the saint. He started as a Rudo. A Rudo, of course, in, in Lucha Libre is a bad guy, and a technical, of course, is a good one. Good guy. But they thought the idea of the mask was gonna make him a, a, a Rudo, and what happened over time was people started liking El Santo, and El Santo became a babyface, and it caught on as a technico with a strict adherence to kayfabe. He wore the mask at home. He wore the mask, uh, he unmasked one time on national television in 1984, and then when he died, he was buried in that mask. So if that tells you the, the lore of El Santo, and El Santo, of course, was in, he had no, uh, novellas. He, I did a report on this in college. He had novellas. He had uh, movies that went from early on where he just beat everybody with a, a forearm smash to at the end where he was facing zombies, Martians, and Santa Claus. I'm not kidding on that one. But the, the idea of this character, again, what made the character was this mask, this white mask, El Santo, the saint. Wrestling in North America was it took a little different path. You, of course, you have Mr. Wrestling and Mr. Wrestling 2. Uh, of course, we're talking about Johnny Walker, and we have Tim Woods. And, and I'll get to Tim Woods in a bit. And there's something about Tim Woods that you really need to know, talking about the mask and talking about kayfabe. Now, there's different ways in how masks are used, how they're used in a promotion, how they're used. Now, in Mexico, the mask is really done, again, it's a, it's a tradition. Not every luchador wears them. I mean, uh, good examples are Pero Guayo, Pero Guayo Jr., uh... Ray Mendoza, I don't believe Ray Mendoza, although his sons did, uh, Vianos, I believe they wear a mask, Gory Guerrero didn't wear a mask, and so on and so forth. But those that do wear the mask, there's a tradition that goes along with it. Again, that's something I'll get into. But in American promotions, the mask is sort of used more as a prop. It can be used in any different ways. One of the ways they use it in American promotions is when they're trying to disguise someone who is clearly someone you know. Like, okay, someone gets suspended or fired in wrestling, no one's really fired, but whatever. They do that. And then the character or a new character comes in in a mask, but it's clear that's who they are. It was the case of Midnight Rider and Dusty Rhodes. This is a case where they use the mask as a, for lack of a better word, a mask to keep who they are a secret from everyone but the wrestling fans. The fans see it immediately in most cases, and they make it very obvious, but the announcers don't get it, any kind of bookers don't get it, and the other wrestlers don't get it. And that puts the fans sort of in that driver's seat, like, oh, I know it's Dusty Rhodes behind the Midnight Rider, but no one else seems to get it. This was done again with Yellow Dog by both Brian Pillman and Barry Windham over the years. Stagger Lee, now Stagger Lee is a very interesting story. Anyone who watched WCW used to remember Dusty Rhodes referring to Lee Marshall as Stagger Lee. That term goes back actually pretty far. It goes back to Mid-South. Mid-South, the story was that Junkyard Dog, who was the most famous, most over character in Mid-South at the time, and you'd argue ever, who was one of those popular athletes in, in all of Louisiana, beating out P Pistol Pete Maravich at one point. There's a sports reference for you. Anyway, he was suspended for 90 days. Now, while he's suspended, another person who looks awfully a lot like 
junkyard dog but with a mask on named Stagger Lee shows up and really gets the best of those those heels. Now everyone in the world over time you saw the mannerisms, you saw the way he carried himself in the ring, all these different things. It was clearly to everyone else it was the junkyard dog. But they could never prove it. And the heels would keep going, oh, it's this junkyard dog. He broke the rules and he's not on his suspension. If he's not on suspension, as soon as we find out that it's junkyard dog behind the mask, you gotta fire him. You gotta fire him. And he's gonna make Bill Watts fire him. Well, 90 days was up. Junkyard dog officially came back. And then, what do you know? There's actually a real Stagger Lee. Now, of course, in this case, the real Stagger Lee, quote unquote, was played by Coco Beware before he got the bird and went to the WWE, but he was Coco Ware. And Coco Ware became the new Stagger Lee, but it was, no, it, was no, it was always played like it was two separate people. Of course, this is also done, this was done in, as late as the, you know, in 1997, 1996, 1997, PG-13, same scenario. They were suspended from the USWA, and then next thing you know, these two masked guys called the Cyberpunks show up. And if clearly, they were PG-13, but they played at the mask thing to make it appear like they were someone else. Then, of course, then there's also Owen Hart and the Blue Blazer. And, for, and, 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 and of course, that has a horrible, horrible outcome. And I don't mean to bring the episode down, but that's what happens. But again, he was trying to play it off like these are two separate people. At one point, even having someone come out and it was clearly a black guy in the costume, which means clearly it wasn't Owen Hart to that point. This lasted, this actually happened up until night, uh, 2003 with the Hulk Hogan Mr. America thing, which was literally the mask cut, was cut, the mouth hole was cut out enough so you could see his handlebar, his, his Fu Manchu mustache. So it's clearly Hulk Hogan, but the whole thing was Vince McMahon trying to prove it was him. Mr. America going to the point of a weird, comedically like 1950s style um, lie detector that beat when you got it wrong, which is really stupid. But Mr. America was never proved to be Hulk Hogan until the end where he left the company, pulled the mask up off TV and they, yeah, whatever. But then there's that. Then there's the interesting story. This one's actually really funny. I knew a little about this and then I did some research on it of the machines. At the time, Bobby Heenan was managing Big John Studd and King Kong Bundy. Now, of the time before Andre the Giant turned on Hulk Hogan became the super heel that he was, Andre was a big baby face. He was suspended from the WWF for missing a match, I believe. And he came back as Giant Machine. Basically, Andre the Giant, singlet and everything, but he was wearing this black mask. And he was Giant Machine. And again, no one knew who Giant Machine was, despite the fact that there was no one in the world at the time as big as Andre the Giant. And again, that's a little nod to the fans. Then there was Super Machine, which of course was played by Bill Eady, who will also come up on this when we're talking about the Masked Superstar. They were then joined by Big Machine, which was Blackjack Mulligan, again, you know, wearing, a bla wearing a black mask. And then it got to the point, like, it was always a thing where the heels, in this case, Bobby Heen and Big John Stud, King Kong Bundy, were being upended by these clear other wrestlers wearing the machine mask. I mean, Giant Machine was clearly Andre, and I, I don't know if you necessarily know Blackjack Mulligan, you know, body-wise, but, you know, people knew. And then it got sort of weird because it was, like, a nightly thing, and then everyone knew who they were, and that's where it got funny. There was Animal Machine, which was played by Georgie Animal Steel, who was one point had the hairiest body I've ever seen in my life. It's like him and Fidel Sierra. It's weird. Then there's Crusher Machine, which was the Crusher. I can't even, it was the Crusher. I don't know. Like, you know the Crusher, the Crusher. Piper Machine was Roddy Piper. Duh. And then of course there was Hulk Machine, who was Lou Ferrigno. At least it should have been. Okay, it was Hulk Hogan, whatever. Now, then there's the role of how masks translate or don't translate into America. Rey Mysterio in WCW had a aura about him as Rey Mysterio, as did many of the luchadors. WCW didn't see that. They just they took it off him in 1998. And they they he just looked like, and it's not offense to Rey Mysterio, but he's a smaller guy, but he looked like a 12-year-old. That's really what happened. They took the mask off him. He looked like a 12-year-old wearing uh, camouflage pants, and it just took the aura around him. Now, Juventud Guerrera... Same deal. He told, he lost it in WCW, but what's really interesting is there in Mexico, and I, I know I keep going back to Lucha Libre, but this is very important to Lucha Libre. There is a council in, in Mexico that basically determines whether or not you're allowed, because Lucha Libre is actually treated very seriously. There is a council whether you're allowed to wear your mask again. Junto Guerrero lost the mask in 1998 when WCW folded. Well, he was fired from WCW, but that's beside the point. Basically, after WCW, if he was done with WCW, he went back to Mexico. Went before the council if he could wear his mask again, and the council turned him down. He couldn't put it back on. So Juventud Guerrera has not worn a has not been a professional wrestler. He's not wearing mask in, in Mexico since nineteen you know since nineteen ninety eight because it was just so important 
and, and they're the culture, and they decided he'd been at without it for too long. And you can have a character that loses the mask and then becomes a different character. Uh, Cybernetico is a good example of that. Or, I mean, the original Rey Mysterio. Uh, not the one we know, but the original Rey Mysterio lost his mask, kept going. And there's so many. So you can lose the mask and have a whole career after that. But it is basically a com it's the same name, but it's a completely different character. Uh, El Macias, um, Ricky Menderes, things like that. Then there's the guys that are o basically over only because of their mask. And that's what I'm talking about, Mil Mascaris. The reality was the, the, the cultural zeitgeist that supported El Santo. People don't understand. El Santo was such a big cultural icon. To this day, you'll see murals. You'll see um, jackets with, with stuff on the jacket about El Santo. You will see things. This was a cultural icon. And of course, people were trying to get on their own. So as El Santo's star was sort of fading and becoming almost a, a Hogan-esque sort of in the background, they decided they were going to create a new character. And the new character was named Mil Mascarisk. And that was literally Men of a Thousand Masks. That's literally what they're going for. And his gimmick was he never wore the same mask twice. So while El Santo wore the same white mask for 40 years, Mil Mascarisk didn't wear the same didn't wear the same mask for four days. And that, that was sort of the thing. But Mil Mascaris, as people have talked about, is that he sort of got in his own head and became this uh, egomaniacal lunatic. And he thinks of himself like more than he's a gimmick. The gimmick was the mask. And the mask got over, but it wasn't because Mil Mascaris was really thrilling any crowds. It was because it was the mask. It was a gimmick, and the mask got over. And the reality was Mil Mascaris wasn't thrilling anybody because he wrestled like there was a refrigerator with a back problem. Okay? That's pretty much what it was. Also in Lucha Libre, it's the importance of the mask is winning them. Sometimes, like, the highest achievement is not winning a mask. It's not winning a match. It's not winning a championship. It's winning someone's match in a match called a Luchas de Apuestas, which is, means a bet fight, where each wrestler bets their mask. And if they don't have a mask, they bet their hair. The match are culminations of long-time feuds with really heat, and the winner is the person who gains the other one's mask or hair, and is the ultimate, ultimate victory. And the thing is about these characters are they're they're so wrapped up in these masks and so much these characters that for many of them that once they lose the mask, then it's customary where they explain their real name, they reveal where they're from, how long they've been wrestling, and they show the face in the ring, and it's this big deal. Because what you understand is there are guys right now uh, who are really young, like Pentagon, uh, Pentagon Jr., uh, Ray Phoenix. We don't know their real names. Like in wrestling, like in American wrestling. You could probably tell the last time Triple H had a bowel movement. The answer is last month. And, and everyone knows everything about them. You know their parents' names. You know their kids' names. You know all this stuff. In Mexico, literally, once they wear the mask, they are two separate people. And if they're in public, they're wearing the mask. If they're not in public, they're... We don't know who, like, Pentagon Jr. and Ray Phoenix are. We don't know their real names. Like, to this day. If they're ever unmasked, we might. We do know their real-life brothers, but that's about all we really know. If that tells you anything about the level of kayfabe that women keep... Even in Mexico, to this day, that we have characters we don't really know, and most of the time we don't know who their real who their real name until they leave a promotion and leave a gimmick behind. In the case of uh, L.A. Park, or they lose the mask. In this case of Psychosis or Juventud Guerrera, we don't necessarily know everything. A again, uh, this is more in Mexico. In America, like I said, we know pretty much everything, but in Mexico, it's still a very closely guarded secret. So the mask does represent secrecy. It represents tradition, and so if when so for someone to lose a luchas de apuestas match. They are losing an identity. And again, you can make a career after it. You can lose your mask and still become a character. And there's many people who have done it. And like I said, there's some that never put the mask on in the first place. But the mask is so, so important. And that's what I think that Americans don't understand. You know, guys like Ray Bucanero and Shocker have had second... They've had second acts in their careers after losing their mask. But losing it is still a major thing and you have to rebound from that and you still have to be a star and that's something that not everyone can do now some notable lucha de apuestas matches include la parka unmasking both cybernetico and el macias which is ricky Menderes and all of these and, and things like that so these are important matches guys that you know there are some gimmicks that where they they all they do is carry the mask like they they win the mask and it's a trophy and that's a part of the gimmick and that can that can build a that can build a good technical, it can build a good Rudo. It depends on how you do it. But the idea that someone wins their mask, that's more important than the title belt in many cases. And that's something that's different in America. In America, overall, if you I don't care what the promotion is, the idea is to win the title. Win the heavyweight title. And in Lucha Libre, it does there are certain things like honor and there's certain things that are more important, like masks, like hair, respect, doing things whether you're a technical and doing things the right way or a Rudo and doing things the bad way, so on and so forth. That are actually, in many cases, most of the time, more important than the actual title belt, which is really unique. And masks play a major role in that. 
The Destroyer Dick Beyer was the first wrestler to wear a mask in Japan in the 1960s. And he was huge over there. Absolutely amazing. And, and to this, I mean, you'd see him as recently as a few years ago. Whenever the Destroyer would do something, he'd be wearing the, he'd be wearing the mask. He's a 70, 80-year-old man, and he's still wearing the Destroyer mask. I mean, you want to talk about gimmick, you know. But again, but wrestling is different in Japan. And like I said, now you'll see guys that take that Lucha inspiration uh, take that Lucha or even American, but then they transfer that over to Japan. So you have guys like Jushin Thunder Liger, Ultima Dragon, the great Sasuke, the late Hayabusa, uh, the current talent named uh, Bushi, Kendo Kashin. Uh, then you had Black Tiger, who was, of course, Eddie Guerrero, Wild Pegasus, which was Chris Benoit. You know, uh, there's ha- of the, the Tiger Mask. Tiger Mask is a huge gimmick. You know, Satoru Sayama, Mitsuharu Masao was Tiger Mask 2. Koji Kanemoto was Tiger Mask 3. Uh, you, I mean, right now we're on Tiger Mask W, which is an anime. It gets weird. But the mask is, is something that's actually translated to Mexico. It's not 100%. I mean, it's not as important in Mexico, uh, in, in Japan, that it is in Mexico. It's not as important in general. I would say it's more important than in America. Because in America, I'm not going to say there's no... I mean, there are someone, some people wearing the mask. But if you're, like, in a national program, if you're in a national show... I mean, look at Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn was a guy wearing a luchador mask for how many years, you know? And then he took the mask off and, you know, he became Sami Zayn. But WWE didn't bring him in like that. So a mask on a main stage, I mean, Kane, uh, Mick Foley, who actually took the mask off quite a bit. I can't think of a, you know, Vader who took it off. As far as an actual mask, again, we're not in a North America. We're not talking about a major mask superstar since, ironically, the mask superstar, Bill Eady, back in the 70s. I mean, we haven't seen a major guy with a mask on that was a that was a big part of wrestling in the mainstream in years and that's so that's different so i think in japan it's a little more important than it is in america but i think i don't think it's near as important as it is in mexico then of course in america another way to use them is the a mask is used to disguise someone's nationality you know kato of the orient express along with tanaka was played by the true japanese national paul diamond yeah what's more in 2000, Jamie-san was played by Jamie Noble from West Virginia. Quang was a Japanese ninja played by a Puerto Rican named Savio Vega. I couldn't make this up if I had to. Then, of course, there's the old school way to use the mask. There is the mask that the guys just fill in, you know, uh, the 4,000 guys who played Mr. X. Or one of the guys lucky enough to be Dr. X. They got a promotion. WCW and the WF both had their versions of Dr. X. The WF version was played by Tom Pritchard, of all people, after Chris Candido left his similar paired partner. Dr. X, a.k.a. Tom Pritchard, would lose to Brockus at In Your House, It's Time. I'm going to say that again. Tom Pritchard lost to Brockus. Holy crap. That man deserves to be in the Hall of Fame just for that. The original Dr. X was Dr. Bill Miller, who was a veterinarian, hence the doctor thing. He worked for the original Sheik in Detroit, and even at one point challenged Bruno San Martino in the mid-60s. He was unmasked on multiple occasions. He said unmasking is supposed to be a big deal. It really wasn't. Uh, he was unmasked by Ber- Vern Gagne and Bob Ellis in 1960, and by Ricky Dozan in 1961 in Japan. And I'm, I'm going to do an episode where I talk about Japanese wrestling, and I'll explain the significance of Ricky Dozan. It's, it's very unique. Then, of course, in America, there's when the masks don't work, when there are angles that just don't work, and they, they use a mask to sort of disguise something, and then something changes. The first one I would say is I mentioned in the Magnificent Seven episode. Go check that out where I talk about uh, the Magnificent Seven, the, the last faction in WCW history and why it failed. But going into a match, they had this mystery person, this mystery guy who was going to be the fourth man in, in this four-man match, and the fourth man ended up being Road Warrior Animal. I don't know. It just didn't come off. Real War Animal's not really uh, known for a singles guy, because he's not. And it just, it fell flat. When you took it off, you're like, oh, okay, Real War Animal, whatever. Then, of course, in early WCW, there was the Black Scorpion angle, which was supposed to be Al Perez. This, if you don't know, there's this angle where Sting is being tormented by this guy called the Black Scorpion. He's decked out head to toe in black fabric, and he's wearing a black mask. And it's just, just enough to show his mouth, you know, so he can move his mouth. And he would do these, like, really parlor trick, magic tricks type thing. He would have stuff disappear or it'd be a tiger or puffs of smoke or whatever trying to torment sting and the idea was this match was going to go to a cage and in the cage sting was gonna sting was gonna beat the black scorpion and then he was gonna unmask him now the guy who's gonna unmask was gonna be al perez 
and Al Perez was doing actually really well for himself, and they were going to bring him in, and this was a way to, to even if you took the mask off him, this was going to be a way to put Al Perez as a top guy immediately, because he's already had an angle with Sting. Even if the Black Scorpion thing fa falls, you have Al Perez in a top program with Sting right out the gate. That sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? But apparently Al Perez had a problem with, you know, losing a long storyline, losing a match to the top guy being Sting, which makes no sense. So finally, when they get to the thing, they're doing all these things for months and months and months, and they get to the show, and Al Perez isn't behind the mask. Who's behind the mask? They wanted to put Barry, put Barry Windham, and Barry Windham's like, what, 6'5"? And this Black Scorpion character was clearly not 6'5". So they wanted to put him in it, have him take on this Barry Windham, no one would have bought it, meh. So Ric Flair, to his credit, said, no, 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 you do this, you, you do this to Barry Windham, you're going to hurt him, you can't hurt me, put it on me. So going into that match, Ric Flair comes out, and this is almost like the Mr. America thing, you know, ones where he's clearly that person, the Stagger Lee stuff. Ric Flair comes out, his, his blonde hair is sticking out the back of the mask, so it's clearly, clearly Ric Flair. I mean, you, you mean he might as well come out with like a giant, giant feathery robe and a girl on each arm. I mean, it was Ric Flair, right? So during the match, Ric Flair, I'm sorry, the Black Scorpion is unmasked to reveal, surprise, surprise, it's Ric Flair. Yeah, it went over like a fart in church. So, yeah. Then, of course, there's the way you see... I keep saying, then, of course. Wow, I should stop doing that. You use this guy's old talent as new. Black Blood was just Billy Jack Haynes when they were trying to forget that he was Billy Jack Haynes and crazy. John Tenta, after being an earthquake, avalanche, shark, and even John Tenta for a bit, returned to the WF in 1998 as Golga, a guy with a lump on his head and an unhealthy relationship with a Cartman doll. Never mentioned that he was earthquake never mentioned he was john tenta he was a completely separate guy supposed to be like a hunchback gimmick i don't know it it was fine for what it was the gimmick wasn't great but it was what it was speaking of the oddities he was part of the group called the oddities speaking of the oddities i have a future episode coming up i'm gonna do on the exclusively on the insane clown posse and wrestling be on the lookout for that i literally i've taken notes and i didn't think it was being as rich as it is i didn't think it would be as interesting but man it's gonna be interesting so stay tuned for that one. It's going to be a fun episode, and I'm going to do that in the future. But moving on. Then then you use mask guys as jobbers, you know, smaller, less independent promotions. It's almost like using a doink, although it's easier to use a mask guy because, you know, the real doink isn't dead. The real doink's dead, and a guy in a mask really is hard to prove that he's dead. Whatever. In smaller, let's say less legit indie promotions... Some talents used under a mask for a second or sometimes third match. A referee might be a wrestler, you know, cross-trained or things like that. I went to a show my when I was training. Oh, my God. It was, I want to say, 12 years ago. Man, that's a long time ago. Probably about 12 years ago, yeah. I was at an indie show in Indiana, a little small promotion, ran only a handful of shows, where the guy who wrestled one of the earlier matches then came out later under a mask. He went in the mask during, during his, his match. But he came out later in a mask, and he was a private in a guy he this guy did like a military gimmick and he had these like masked soldiers with him and the guy from like the third or fourth match came out and he was one of the masked guys because quite frankly the show needed bodies and they put a mask on him he didn't have to work a match he just came out there to stand there and so you can do that and a lot of, a lot of companies do that the little mask guy who's just sort of a backup or but sometimes they'll work different matches that just use the mask to disguise that they don't have as many people. You know, if they need 15 people and they have 14 people on the card, well, then someone might be putting a mask. You know, it might be a, might be a Mr. X night. And I think that's more common back in the indies, back in the territory days, than it is now. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm sure there is. I mean, I once watched, you know, a Ohio Championship Wrestling show. Oh, my God. Probably longer than 17. Probably about 19 years ago. No, it wasn't that long. About 15 years ago. And they had a guy come out there, and he was the Sheik of Araby. And for those of you that don't know, the Sheik of Araby was the original gimmick of the original Sheik. That's what he used to be called. And it was, like, clearly less like a white guy who put a mask on and wrestled. So he probably wrestled again because he was just the main event because they needed somebody for the main event. It happens, but I think it was more common back in the territory days than it is now. Although, I'm sure it does happen now. I just don't think it's that's common. Certain characters have multiple personalities. Certain wrestlers can be a different personality depending on what mask they're wearing. Christopher Daniels in America, everyone knows him as the fallen angel, the guy who ran how many runs into, how many times he wrestled for TNA and how many times he came this close to working for WB on screen. Then in Japan, he's a thing called Curry Man, which is a whole different character. He's a goofy bastard and funny too. He's actually, for as I know, only worked a couple matches in America as Curry Man. I know TNA brought him in at one point. And they put pants on him, and it was just weird. But the actual original Curry Man, I, I remember seeing him in Ring of Honor one time. Um, not common, but I mean, it's basically two different characters, and it became this meme to bring him over. 
and to do stuff as Curry Man. But for a long time, Curry Man, he was Curry Man in Japan, and he was Christopher Daniels here, and they're two entirely separate characters. Dud B up that one, one, you know, one degree, and they had Gregory Helms and the Hurricane. And they played like a Clark Kent Superman thing where Gregory Helms was a reporter and, and Hurricane was a superhero and they tried to play it off like they were two separate people. It was sort of a wink and nod to the audience, but it was something you could do there to where the guy's wearing a mask and he's has a hurricane and he's not wearing the mask and he's someone else. And again, I think the, the audience is sophisticated enough to know this is the same guy. So more than anything, it's played up to the hilt. It's played to the comedy, but it's still pretty interesting to see that even in, even in the 2000s, they were doing stuff like that. There are guys who have mass gimmicks early in their career and go into becoming themselves or something else. Mr. JL worked for w WCW back in the early days of the Cruiserweight division and well into 96, 97. It was played by a guy you may know better as Jerry Lynn, a guy who said he was com he was yelled at in WCW for having too good of matches. I believe that. I absolutely do. Early, early in his career, there was a guy called the Master of Pain who later ditched the mask and became The Undertaker. That's a way big jump. On the other end is Lord Humongous. One of the people who used to play Lord Humongous, among probably 11 people to do it, was a guy you know as Sid. Also, another person to play that gimmick would be, years later, would be his own son. Again, I'm not joking, but Lord Humongous was a take on Road Warrior, the big guy with the hockey mask, the whole gimmick. Yeah, that was Lord Humongous. Then there's Doomsday. I've mentioned in the USWA ups. I've mentioned uh, before uh, Doomsday. Glenn Jacobs was sent down to USWA to put on a, a mask, a big hockey mask type thing with like a skull painted on the front of it. Lord Humongous style gimmick. He did it to learn how to work in a mask. Why? Because a few months later, they were going to bring him onto TV as Kane, who we also have to learn to work a mask. So he was. it was Doomsday for only a few months, but it was something where he had to learn. And again, no one, and now you know, but if you watched, do, you watched USWA in mid-1997, like I did, and you watched WWE in, in late-97, like I did, you would not make the connection that they were the same guy. It was just two big guys in a mask, but it was something where it was used to disguise the fact that this guy was going to be on WWE television in six months. So, again, very interesting. Before I leave this episode, I want to talk about the levels of kayfabe someone would keep with masks. Masks now are, are I mean, there are some guys who kept that. I, I know for a fact that uh, Sami Zayn, El Generico, years ago, even on MySpace. Remember MySpace? Uh, uh the early 2000s. Mm. Anyway, on MySpace, when uh, Kevin Owens, Kevin Steen, or El Generico would post something, even if he was in the in the picture, n you know, unmasked because they were hanging out after a show, they would sometimes block his face, or they would put the they would like Photoshop the mask onto him. Like that's the level of level of kayfabe they'd keep, so you didn't know what he looked like. I know a guy that still does that to this day is uh, Hunter Hunter Johnston, who is. Uh, Delirious, who's the booker for Ring of Honor. I know to this day, that I've never seen the guy without his mask. I think I might have caught an old picture of him online, maybe. And I'm not 100% sure on that. But you talk about kayfabe. Here's the level of kayfabe that used to be kept. And there's some guys that I know there used to be a guy named OMG. He used to be part of the Naptown Dragons uh, with Drake Younger and Scotty Vortex and guys like that. He would walk, he would leave the show wearing a, like a thing over his face or whatever. So there were guys who keep it. But it used to be like everyone kept it. If you wore a mask, you wore a damn mask. Here's the level of kayfabe that used to be, and I'm going to go back to a really infamous in incident in professional wrestling, but there's a reason for it. On October 4th, 1975, Ric Flair was on an airplane with John Johnny Valentine, Bob Bruggers, Tim Woods, and David Crockett. Now, those names, you may know, who's Tim Woods? Tim Woods is Mr. Wrestling 2. Now, at the time... Johnny Valentine, who was a heel, was feuding with Mr. Wrestling 2, but they were both on the plane. Now, reportedly, now the plane crashes because an engine, uh, the engine runs out of fuel. They knew they could get somewhere on the other engine. The other engine runs out of fuel. And they crash. Now, in the in the thing, the pilot is killed. Johnny Valentine is paralyzed and permanently retired. Ric Flair breaks his back, and Tim Woods also breaks his back. As the first responders get there, Tim Woods gives his real name, George Wooden, to disguise the fact that he was on the flight. Now, here's where it gets bad. He goes to the hospital, gets the name George Wooden. People didn't know he was on, he was Mr. Wrestling Tim Woods. He went by his real name. He gets to the thing, he breaks his back, he gets out of the hospital. Rumors are circulating he was on the flight with the heels. That he was on there with Valentine and Flair, who were both heels, and Mr. Wrestling Tim Woods was the good guy, so he's on the flight. Now, to, to stop this rumor that's absolutely true from continuing mr wrestling tim woods 
to keep kayfabe, and I, I want to stress this very, very strongly, put his mask back on, got into the ring with a broken back only weeks after a goddamn plane crash. He wrestled with a broken back with the mask on to prove that the guy who was on the flight wasn't Mr. Wrestling. That's kayfabe as hell, man. But it tells you the power of the mask. It tells you the power of kayfabe. And I know that's the thing that's sort of gone the way of the dodo these days. And I, even that expression, way of the dodo, is probably an old expression. Can't think of a better one, so sue me. But that's the thing of a mask. The mask used to be that holy, even in America. That was something you you had this visceral response, man. If you were, if Mr. Woods, if Mr. Wrestling 2, Tim Woods was in the ring, that was Mr. Wrestling. That was Mr. Wrestling 2. That was it. And the idea that, you know, oh, well, this George guy, well, that's not the same guy. Well, this guy's Mr. Wrestling's in the ring. He's wrestling. He couldn't wrestle on a broken back. He did. So I want you to keep that in mind. I want you to keep in mind when you talk about wrestling, and, and on a serious note, when you talk about pro wrestling, and you talk about these guys, what they go through, and especially what they used to go through, man. They used to go through a lot worse. This guy wrestled on a broken back to keep kayfabe. He put the mask on, and he became a holy different character that's insane and it's it's one of those things that rick flair even said that was the day that tim woods saved professional wrestling he preserved kayfabe to a level that honestly i can't imagine anyone would do many people would do at the time and i don't know if anyone would do it now i'm not expecting them to i'm not going to sit here as a fan and expect them to what i am saying is that's that's ridiculous i mean maybe it's foolish maybe it's foolhardy maybe it's stupid i don't know but the idea that someone was going to wrestle like that in such pain just to preserve kayfabe, just to show everyone that Mr. Wrestling 2 was okay, even while the real George Wooden wasn't, there's nothing you can say to that. And I commend the man. I commend what, again, may have been a foolhardy experiment. It may have been a bad idea for his health, but you got to commend a guy who has that kind of dedication. Well, that's going to do it for me today. My name's Dan. This is Exploder. And until next time, have a good one.